Hey everybody, Ethan here. Welcome to Hello Road. So you might remember a few weeks back, I picked up this 1985 Mitsubishi Galant for only $1,500. And I found out that it actually was in pretty good shape. Runs and drives great. It's got a few leaks, got a few issues here and there. But overall for $1,500, I thought this was an excellent deal. Now here in the States, you just don't see Galants anymore of this generation. You don't really see Galants in general at all, but this generation in particular, there's just very few of these left here. Now many of the quote boring and utilitarian cars from the 80s and 90s have disappeared from the roads. Once they get past their serviceable life, once the repairs get a little bit too expensive, many of these cars just got junked. If the whole purpose of the car was just to get you from point A to point B, there wasn't a whole lot of reason to spend a ton of money to keep the thing on the road. At some point somebody would just go and buy a new appliance car. <laughs> Of course, you and I know there's more to this car than just a sedan to get you to and from work. The Galant is certainly a step above the Camrys of the day, a bit larger and had a touch more luxury. But after cars like this crested 100,000 miles or were on their second or third owner, there wasn't much love left for them. But now that decades have passed, I think it's time to start appreciating these undesired cars, these utilitarian cars, these cars that were only meant to last 10 years and then get junked. And when somebody was designing this Galant, I'm not sure they were thinking that somebody would even really care about this car 30, 40 years later. But I do, I like cars like this. So I paid $1,500 for this car, which who knows, that might have even been a little bit too much, I'm not really sure. And I intend to put some money into this vehicle, which is pretty stupid because whatever I put into this car, I'm not gonna get out of it if I sell it. It's not really much of an enthusiast market for fifth generation Galants. So I'm really putting the money into this car just to keep it on the road, to keep it as one of the last remaining examples of a fifth generation Galant in the United States. At the very least, I'll get to appreciate this car for a while and maybe with a little bit of searching, I'll find somebody else at some point that will love this car just as much as I do. So yeah, ultimately my goal is not to try to flip this thing. This is like the worst candidate for a flip. Basically my primary objectives are to keep this car from going to the crusher and to try to tell a story about utilitarian cars and how they're worth keeping around. And to take us back to a time when cars were boxy and angular like this, I love the design of this thing. All right, so while this car does run pretty well, there are a few issues with this thing. So let's get it over to Sean's Auto Care and talk to Joe and see if he can help us figure out what's going on with this thing and take care of a few issues. I know for a fact that it needs two axles, so I've already bought those. It also needs tie rods and belts, so I'm gonna bring those over there as well. But I'm sure, like always, they'll find some more things wrong with this car that I didn't already know were wrong. So let's go. Today we're going to find out a lot of the things that are wrong with my 1985 Mitsubishi Galant and a lot of the things that Joe has fixed. So let's check it out. Welcome back, Joe. All right. How's it going? You're right. Going good, man. Here it uh, is, number whatever. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> oh, there we go. Look at that. This is... Uh, that might be an issue. Yeah. Maybe. That could I mean, possibly it's be. It's like a speed hole. Yeah, it's exactly. Less weight rate reduction. Yeah, um, I should add a few more of those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll put some, we'll put some here, and here, and here, yeah. and here too. I'd say that could be the cause of the exhaust sound, huh? I mean, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> as far as the back of the car goes, everything was fine back here. I mean, the stuff was like a little uh, dirty and stuff, but nothing was completely blown out. These aren't blown out like rubbers. This is like the paint from the rubber that just like comes apart and flakes off after it flexes and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, other than that, everything back here was fine. Uh, the brakes back here were fine when I took them off. Just, you know, original stuff. The rest, again, if you see here, there's another hole ah. starting to develop here. It's like 
I can see a little bit of... Just at the top. I, I don't know why. That's actually really interesting. Now I'm, now I'm starting to get curious. Because usually the water pulls at the bottom of pipes. And then the hole will come at the bottom unless water's coming at the top. It's interesting. Coming through the top. Like water would have to come down from up top and just continuously... That's interesting. Actually, there's more holes in the top of them. Yeah. This is the original cat. Looks like two of them. Double up. Um, this car we already worked on. We already replaced a bunch of stuff. So you'll see new inner and outer tie rods. You'll see a new axle out here. What else? I didn't do the ball joints on this one. Both sides have them. We greased everything up. That was fine. Um, this thing does have a leak from the transaxle, the transmission, whatever you want to call it. Very visible leak. It's very big. I mean, when I was down here, I tried to uh, clean it up as much as I could, but there's no point of like going in ham. At least fix the leak first. I think what I what I did was the mounts as yeah. well. So um, it's, it's it might be hard, hard to see, but yeah. it's uh, just standard like donut looking mount. You stick it in, throw a bolt in. So this one right here is also the new mount. The one in the back looks similar to that. It thinks like a little taller and a little narrow, but it's the same concept. It's a donut. So in terms of redoing those mounts, do you do one at a time? Usually, if if it has four mounts. Uh, the engine and the transmission are supported by two mounts on the outermost parts to like the frame rails or the chassis Whatever you want to call it so I can actually take this bar off take this mount off and remove that one And it would be suspended by the existing mounts. What I did was I, I did the first the bottom two first mm -hmm. um, Since I was removing that replacing the axle what I did was I pulled the axle out It gave me a little more room to remove the back one I removed the bracket from the engine block took those bolts out and then everything just kind of like fished down out of there Because this bar was missing and this axle was missing um, yep. After that, you put it back in, you throw the bolts, tighten it all up. Axles went in, inner and outers went in, and then I moved my way up to the top. You can see that I also replaced all three of the serpentine belts here. There's one for the alternator, there's one for the power steering pump, and then there's one for the AC. Back then, I guess uh, there was like one belt for every main component. Nowadays, you, uh, you have one belt for all the components. You just like snake it in a very intricate way. You have one tensioner back then. You have one belt for every one of these components. Yeah, so this is the kind of thing you don't really see very much. No, nah, that's not really common. This is like 80s, 90s cars yep. after like early 2000s. And now it's like one belt. Sometimes you'll have a, a second belt for like the AC, mm -hmm. um, but usually everything gets routed with one belt. Like newer cars, I mean, newer cars now don't even have uh, power steering or um, the water pump is ran by like the timing belt or like the timing chain or something. It has its own pulley on the front. So there's like one belt for like from the crank to like the water pump to the alternator and that's it. And like power steering is like electrical now. Uh, AC is electrical now on, yep. on some of these cars. Yeah, I'm sort of curious, how often do you work on cars from the 80s and 90s? And do you prefer working on older cars? I do work on older cars a lot because like me and my brother are into older cars. Yeah. I mean, my cars are like a 91 Mustang. Uh, like I was telling you before, I just bought a 94 E36. Uh, my brother used to have a 89 Cressida. He has an uh, IS300 now. I prefer it. But it has its perks. So sure. it depends on what it is. For me personally, I work on a lot of them because I like them. You know, they're like uh, my yeah. guilty pleasure. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, the way we like to torture ourselves. You know, nowadays newer cars are way easier um, to to have less things go wrong with them. The, the, the engineering behind newer cars is just getting better and better and better. Yeah, but as far as preference, I think older cars are fun. Is there anything you don't like about working on older vehicles? Like a car oh, like this, is there anything you're kind of like, it's kind of a pain in the butt or? Honestly, no, the, there's nothing specifically that like deters me from working on older cars. What does is like um, electrical gremlins mm. on older cars are harder to find because the technology doesn't back the like diagnostic processes that much. So what I mean is like, for example, newer cars, I have like a really fancy expensive scanner here that I can plug into the car and the computer tells me what's wrong with it. Yep. And it's and then I have uh, kind of like a, a where to start kind of thing. It tells me where sure. to start and then I'll go and I can pull diagrams out. They're intricate. I can ohm stuff out. It's a little easier to like find little grimaces in that way. Older cars, the schematics aren't there to back it up. You can't plug scanners into it. Um, you have to like jump wires and check flashing lights on the dash yeah. and the codes. But yeah, as far as older cars, not really. I mean, just the electrical gremlins, those are just gonna be kind of annoying. Yeah, but yep. Okay. I mean, I'll do it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's not like I won't do it. I can still do it, it's fine. It's just, it's a little more tedious and stuff. And Sure.
So what's going on under here? The last motor mount I got I replaced was this one here. You see like it's brand new. Which worked out because this needs to come off for me to replace the serpentine belts. Really? Yeah. I mean, ah. if it made oh, it yeah, look at that. It made it easier. Anyway. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure that if, you know, I had enough time and uh, mental strength, I guess. Sure. Like, I'd probably be able to do it, but. If you had to replace those, would you just take the motor mount out anyway? If I wasn't replacing it, yeah, yeah. I'd still take it out. Yeah. I mean, yeah, the, the thing is, like, I've been doing this long enough to know that, like, I can spend more time, like, not removing stuff and trying to fish stuff out of the way. Yeah. I get less mentally exhausted. Exhausted. Sure. If I like move stuff, I just remove stuff out of my way. You know. Yeah. I prefer being like physically tired. Than, yeah. Like mentally, because once you get frustrated, like when I was younger, I'd get frustrated and I start being careless. Yeah. So then you start stripping bolts, you start breaking stuff, you don't torch stuff right. It's gonna take the same amount of time anyway. Yeah. So I rather just move it out of the way, do it, and then put it back in, and then um, I'm not stressed out. I'm not. I'm not throwing my tools up, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, so yeah, so like even if I, if I wasn't replacing this, I'd probably just remove it. If it's in my way, I learned that I'd just remove it. There's no reason, I mean, I have the tools and I have the time yeah. to do it. There's no reason to like break something or having to pay for something that I broke just because I was being dumb about, you know what I mean? So yeah, yeah. I would've took it off anyway. And like, that's usually what I tell like other people that are working, trying to work on cars and stuff. If it's in your way, just remove it. I mean, yeah. it's a good experience. You'll know how it works and you won't get upset or like frustrated and stuff. A lot of people, yeah. get, a lot of people get scared of like it not going back. Sure. The way they took it apart. Especially if it, some, if you're a beginner, you think, oh, I'm gonna remove a motor mount. That yeah. sounds serious. Yeah, yeah. So a lot of people, uh, they get discouraged. Like, I get it. You know, don't get me wrong, but it's definitely like what you sign up for. So. Yeah. <laughs> so did you see anything else up here that you thought was like of concern? You know, I'm actually gonna go and like do an oil change and like. Okay. I think I might actually try to replace the valve cover I was gasket. Say the valve cover gasket should be. A I mean, there's quite a bit of oil there, and you'll see some some of it running down the side there like it's, it's yep. pretty wet and stuff I noticed that like for example this hose clamp is like starting to get like a little rusty and a little watery and stuff it might just be, need a new a new hose clamp yeah because it, it looks like it's oozing off the back of the the hose there as well but a new hose clamp would probably you know save it other than that um, there's quite a bit of like an air hoses and stuff that again if you don't have like the right schematics which most cars usually have vacuum home installation and you'll have diagrams up here to like get the routing right um, I can tell that some of the hoses I think like somebody didn't know where this one went so somebody just plugged it there would have been a vacuum leak there if it had somebody not plugged it yeah likely. exactly there's something that like requires a vacuum for it to either function or some sort of diaphragm that needs to be have its feet or whatever you're not gonna figure it out if you don't have like the schematic or like the diagram for it yeah you just won't there's no point in trying unless you have one or else you're gonna end up doing what that what, whoever did that was just yes. start plugging stuff in with with screws and stuff yeah all right, I appreciate it, Joe. Ooh, Thanks for yeah. telling me all the all the stuff that's wrong with all my crappy cars. <laughs> yeah, I'm here to ruin people's days. <laughs> oh, I can relate. Yeah, I cars too. Sure. Even though it's my job, like, I love it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So I think that's gonna be it for today. In the next video with this vehicle, I'll probably take it on a little road trip. What do you think? Where should I go with this car? Probably not too far because I still don't know if I trust it completely yet, but um, yeah, this thing deserves to go on a little trip. Where do you think I should take it? Let me know in the comments below. All right, that's it for today. Thanks so much for watching. I'll have more videos on my fleet of 80s and 90s cars, my fleet of broken cars, my fleet of somewhat fixed cars coming soon. See you later. Where's